City Council members and mayor, my name is Shannon and I live in the South Burlingame neighborhood. My pronouns are she, her. We are presenting our testimony to you today because when we appeared on July 9th to provide testimony in regards to Ordinance 552 funding of district coalitions, we did not have the opportunity to do so. 20 of us assembled having prepared remarks and materials and a request was made we provide our testimony to council members and the mayor privately. We are concerned that we may not be able to assemble many times or even one more time as a group due to health concerns, ongoing medical treatment, quarantine, travel, and poor access to technology. So we became resourceful and have prepared a video compilation through various means to attempt to provide to you similar content to what have been shared on July 9th. I want to start by saying that I've had the privilege of sitting before you many times and value the opportunity to be part of civic engagement. I have presented to you on behalf of South Burlingame and Swirl Neighborhoods, as well as part of Host to Host, culminating in a board position I currently hold with Travel Portland, and I owe my thanks to Amanda Fritz for her thought leadership in suggesting the position be created. I spent five years working alongside my neighbors to prevent the development of a detrimental project. We grew close and formed a strong bond that culminated in my being asked to join our neighborhood association. I did so because I saw the value in supporting neighborhood associations as the recognized entity for civic engagement, and I wanted to continue to show up for my community. I was then asked to be the Sweeney board representative for a neighborhood association. I attended meetings and saw early on that the brain trust in the room stretched back decades. So I opted to glean and participate only when called to do so until I gained my footing. The Sweeney board was being briefed on the code change process for several months. However, in June, there was a shift in energy and a call to arms to fight to preserve the neighborhood coalitions that we were told were at risk of being defunded. I attended the last code change meetings and was asked by the Sweeney president, Leslie Hammond, to be a part of a small group of Sweeney members to educate the community on the harm that was about to occur. I spent tens of hours writing materials for distribution, attending meetings, and designing a PowerPoint, all in an effort to preserve civic engagement that I hold so dear. I will note I at all times supported the position that greater equity and diversity was needed, and I framed the conversation as an and, not or, as the minority position to those planning the event. It was during this time that I started to be exposed to the actions of the executive officers of Sweeney, Sweeney board members, and the executive director that revealed the true nature of the Sweeney culture and is what we would like to share with you. Many of us have come to understand that this taxpayer-funded organization is not fulfilling their mission or honoring their contractual obligations to the city of Portland and its residents. They have exhibited overt and covert systemic minority oppression. We will be sharing how a select few have driven the agenda, how the officers of the board do not adhere to the standards of practice or bylaws that govern the organization, and how those same people actively suppress minority opinions. We will show how the organizational culture manifests its disease in a consistent pattern of bullying, harassment, entitlement, lack of transparency, accountability, and ultimate white privilege. I remain a board member of Sweeney and have consistently sought change internally for the last year to no avail. I turn to you now, hoping you will see evidence of our experience. At the end of this presentation, we will share our hopes for a better future and recommendations to consider for change as you prepare to issue another round of Sweeney funding. Thank you, and we look forward to a brighter Portland. Hello, my name is Jim McLaughlin. I live in the West Portland Park neighborhood in outer Southwest Portland. I've resided there since 1980. I'm a former attorney and during my active career have served as a federal prosecutor and assistant U.S. attorney here in Oregon, an Oregon assistant attorney general working in the financial fraud section of the civil division at the Oregon Department of Justice, and as a private attorney representing clients victimized in various fraud schemes perpetrated by, among others, banks, insurance companies, and car dealers. I was a board member of the West Portland Park Neighborhood Association for several years and served as the president of the WPPNA for several more years. I was the Neighborhood Association's representative to Southwest Neighborhoods, Inc., the coalition of neighborhood associations in Southwest Portland, also for several years. As the WPPNA representative, I was a de facto Sweeney board member. I was a Sweeney board member when we discovered in 1911, I'm sorry, in 2011, by the bouncing of Sweeney's employees' paychecks, the financial irregularities and defalcations 
at Sweeney, which culminated in the prosecution of Sweeney's operations manager, Virginia Stromer, by the then Multnomah County Chief Deputy District Attorney, Rod Underhill. Ms. Stromer pled guilty and was sentenced to 38 months in state prison for embezzling at least $130,000 of taxpayer-provided monies, grants, and contract payments from the then Office of Neighborhood Involvement to Sweeney, going back to at least 2006. I was selected by the then Sweeney president to be on an ad hoc internal Sweeney investigation investigation committee of five Sweeney board members together with the then Sweeney president to review the facts leading to the financial loss and make recommendations for changes in Sweeney policies, practices, and procedures to put Sweeney's financial house in order and to hopefully prevent a repetition. As we culled through Sweeney's financial documents, I realized there was evidence of Sweeney's mismanagement of ONI provided funds that preceded 2011. Specifically, I became, an aware, I became aware of an American Express card and a bill dating to at least 2004 and perhaps earlier. I say perhaps because most, if not all, of Sweeney's hard copy records regarding the Amex card were missing and Amex itself was unable to provide us with copies of Amex records that were that old. In 2004, the Amex card had a balance exceeding $19,000. The very few re records available at Sweeney showed charges for one month of items seemingly not relevant to the Sweeney organization and appearing personal in nature when discovered. The existence of a Sweeney account had not been disclosed to the Sweeney board I'm sorry, to the Amex account, had not been disclosed to the Sweeney board for at least seven years after the initial discovery of the $19,000 in fraudulent charges. Rather than disclose the apparent $19,000 fraud to the Sweeney board in 2004, Sweeney's current and then executive director, Sylvia Bogert, has claimed that she obtained a personal loan to pay off the balance to Amex concealed the facts from the Sweeney board from 2004 through 2011, and apparently made no effort to investigate by whom the Amex charges were made and who benefited from the things purchased with the Amex card. The failure to rapidly disclose the first 2004 embezzlement to the Sweeney board in 2004 and institute proper financial controls allowed a second series of embezzlements culminating in a $130,000 loss to Sweeney and the conviction of Ms. Stromer. The actions were failure to take action by Sylvia Bogart in covering up the existence of the Amex card, supposedly paying off the balance personally, and failing to ensure that documents pertaining to the Amex card were preserved and copies of missing documents obtained at that time from Amex remain unexplained and in my opinion, suspect. Ms. Bogart never did voluntarily come forward, even in the immediate wake of this discoverment of the 2011 Stromer embezzlement. She didn't disclose the Amex card situation. Rather, only when directly asked by a member of the ad hoc investigating committee at a formal Sweeney board meeting, did the executive director finally, reluctantly, admit to the Sweeney board the previous $19,000 unauthorized credit card charges on the Sweeney credit card. In my professional experience, and as a result of my service within the Sweeney organization, it's my opinion that the fiscal management of taxpayer dollars stems from lack of oversight, obfuscation, and omission fostered by Sweeney executive director, Sylvia Bogart. The habit of lying by omission to Sweeney's board Sweeney's constituents, and to the Office of Community and Civic Life, or ONI staff, about things as minor and mundane as Sweeney's record storage and access to those records in response to OCC's current requests is part of a decades-old pattern and practice at Sweeney and infects the entirety of Sweeney's governance. The seven neighborhood I'm sorry, neighborhood coalitions are entrusted with 2.6 million taxpayer dollars annually. I don't speak about the other neighborhood coalitions for I have no personal knowledge of their operations. But for Sweeney, it has operated for far too long 
without external accountability, auditing, oversight, or metrics to gauge effective and responsible use of funds. Sweeney has continued to receive five-year no-bid contracts for the last 40 years, and upon the embezzlement prosecution at Sweeney, it has received the same contract with no increased oversight from the city until the strong action of the city council's July 9th vote withholding payments to Sweeney. Recent actions by the Sweeney board, Sweeney officers, and the executive director, in my opinion, make clear to me that Sweeney requires much greater scrutiny for fiscal responsibility and governance so that taxpayers and residents can be confident the organization is proceeding with integrity. I believe under the leadership of Executive Direct, under the leadership of Executive Director Sylvia Bogart, the organization and its funds will remain at risk. I'm respectfully asking members of the City Council to hold Sweeney to account. Thank you for your time and attention. Dear City Commissioners, my name is Aslan Newson and I am a queer Afro-Indigenous woman using she, her pronouns. I live in the Markham neighborhood in Southwest Portland, a predominantly white neighborhood, and I will be a rising junior at Woodrow Wilson High School, a predominantly white school. I am also on the board of the Hillsdale Neighborhood Association, the HNA. Last September, I led a community conversation, later titled the Wilson Community Conversation, to share the stories of hate and racism that 11 of my classmates and I have experienced as people of color within the Portland Public School System. We shared stories of how fellow students, teachers, and school leaders have participated in covert and overt acts of racism, as well as how negligence allowed the toxic environment to remain unsafe for many of us. When asked by those in the audience how they could help, my response was, quote, what are you going to leave this room and do about it? Our issues and our problems that we face every day are real, and whether you want to take accountability for it, we face it every single day, end quote. My direction for the community was to do the work, to get educated, and to prioritize equity and anti-racism work for themselves and their families. The community needs to change so students, specifically black and indigenous students, can feel safe. I felt compelled to go further and be a part of the change. I joined and was elected to the board of the Hillsdale Neighborhood Association last December and later attended a Sweeney Equity and Inclusion Committee meeting. At first, I was optimistic to participate with a desire to represent my communities, to engage civically, and to be a voice for change. I quickly realized the toxic environment at the Hillsdale Neighborhood Association would do more harm to me than I could help them. I have not returned to the Hillsdale Neighborhood Association as I do not feel safe to participate in the white supremacy culture that has been created, manifested, and perpetuated. While I understand that Sweeney now has a racial equity policy and equity and inclusion best practices, both passed with the lens of equity, when the lens of equity was a priority during the code change when Sweeney grant monies was threatened. These documents are merely words, unless these tools are put into place by the board who understands and is passionate about equity work, especially in majority white institutions like the Hillsdale Neighborhood Association and Sweeney. I agreed to be part of the mission outlined for these organizations by Civic Life, stating district coalitions and neighborhood associations are to be held accountable for delivering racially and socially inclusive outcomes through community and civic engagement. That is the furthest from the experience I had at HNA, and I asked the council to consider, is there an organization that can be funded and makes good on this mandate that is not Sweeney? If so, I would like to be part of an organization that will have me, a proud, queer, Afro-Indigenous woman, as a voice at the table. Thank you for your time. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in this, but I've used it Zoom a number of times now. Uh, number one, you can raise your hands so you're not shouting at each other, and the chair can then recognize the hands. When people are very obstructious, the manager can move them until they're recognized. Hello, Mayor Wheeler and council members. My name is Blythe Olson, and I'm a resident of the Swirl neighborhood. I've been active in neighborhood issues over the years, including door knocking, petition passing, and testimony before city council. 
I'm concerned that over the past year, there have been repeated and unsettling comments made by officers of the Sweeney Board, including Sweeney committee chairs, that at a minimum suppress equity. Some of the expressed positions are overt. For example, President Leslie Hammond has stated in an email that equity is not really the issue. Survival of neighborhoods is the issue. Equity is the red herring to keep us focusing on what is the most important. And former Vice President John Gibbon suggested that uh, members of the Land Use Committee not view their work from an equity lens. They have intentionally not done so in the past and will not do so in the future. This was in regard to equity being included in the Sweeney Committee action plans. Third, Gary Rund, Sweeney Land Use Committee Chair, said that he had read about the historical context of racist planning in complete detail several times and had elected not to bring it into land use at this time, that it is just a perspective. Fourth, Leslie Hammond stated in an email, I'm beginning to think the code revision process is not so much about bringing more people in the neighborhood systems to be heard, but more about eliminating neighborhoods because of our involvement on land use issues. And finally, David Martin, Sweeney Transportation Committee Chair, said he wants to see the equity inclusion and inclusion training motion withdrawn and that from a transportation perspective, all projects are already subjected to a lot of equity. And for Southwest West Portland, it hasn't worked out in our favor. This last statement was made in the context of the Sweeney Board voting down equity and inclusion training for themselves. The racial equity policy initially introduced in draft form to the Sweeney Board of Directors in November 2015 did not substantially change before it was approved by the board in September of 2019. The four years that it took Sweeney to adopt the racial equity policy were filled with actions to prevent its passing. Even as it passed in 2019, it did so with great argument, division, and dissent, and under the pressure of the code change directive to make equity a priority. It has never been used by the board to guide its work since passing. As you consider funding for the Sweeney District, I hope you weigh these statements against the goals of the city. Thank you very much for your time. Mayor Wheeler and city council members, my name is Marilee Carr. I live in South Burlingame and I'm the team leader of our neighborhood emergency team. I'm also a family physician. My pronouns are she, her. I am concerned about the persistent pattern of resistance to equity mandates we have seen in Sweeney executive board members. In that context, it is worrisome that the topic of land use comes up very often in their archived comments and correspondence. Worrisome because land use regulation has historically been a method for cementing inequity, literally. Portland has such a long troubled history of bias in land use that the Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability released a report on it last fall, Historical Context of Racist Planning, a history of how planning segregated Portland with a section on Southwest Portland from the report. Portland, like many U.S. cities, has a long-standing history of racist housing and land use practices that created and reinforced racial segregation and inequities. Exclusionary zoning, racially restrictive covenants, and redlining are early examples of this, with their effects still visible today. These discriminatory practices have all played a role in shaping the city's urban form and in exacerbating inequities along lines of race and class. In 1994, Portland City Council adopted the Community and Neighborhood Planning Program to manage growth and increased density in the city. The program signaled the first potential to shift away from the city's 70-year planning practice of systematically increasing the area zone single family and instead to begin expanding multifamily zoning. Denser zoning was implemented one section at a time, beginning with Albina, then Outer Southeast, then Southwest in 2000, but Southwest put a stop to it. From the report, 
Southwest residents tended to be well-educated, higher income, and typically white. They were also much more organized and well-resourced than Albina and Outer Southeast. And people in Southwest were more effective at using neighborhood associations as a tool for organizing. The final plan was drastically different from the initial plan. Much of the single family zoning was preserved. Land use was treated unequally in different parts of the city, resulting in inequitable outcomes. This report on Portland's long-standing structural racism has been dismissed as just a perspective by members of the Sweeney Executive Board. We have documented that Sweeney leadership has consistently evaded and opposed equity mandates from all levels of government, yet they continue to be funded by tax dollars in five-year no-bid contracts lacking any mechanism for accountability. We have also shown that the faces of the Sweeney Executive Board have not changed in a long while since the same people rotate through the various leadership positions. We may fairly conclude that the beliefs evidenced by their actions are deeply held and not likely to change. Taken as a whole, I cannot avoid the conclusion that the worldview of the Sweeney Executive Board amounts to the polite racism of the rich. I have always been proud to be a Portlander. I am ashamed to be in any way represented by this organization. Please act to make Portland proud again. Thank you for your attention to this matter. And um, I just, you know, I'm just grateful I have Steve, that you guys elected Steve this year because sometimes the cross-section of issues and sometimes the intensity of the issues, are it's nice to have somebody else to talk to. And land use can be like that, <laughs> having thought about it. And when this whole idea, I mean, Catherine didn't say this, but if multifamily is gonna move into that part of, of, of Multnomah, I suspect there'll be fireworks. Yeah, I'm, and I, for the first time in almost 20 years, I'm not on the Sweeney board. I know, and I, I'm I was feeling so great. No. Dear City Council, my name is Sally Eck and my pronouns are she, her, or they, them. I have a master's in education and I'm senior teaching faculty at Portland State University in the Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies Department. I also have a consulting company and my consulting work focuses on social, social justice and equity training. The company is called Heartwork Educational Consulting. I was sent a request for proposal by the Sweeney Equity and Inclusion Committee to provide equity and inclusion training and consulting services to Sweeney. I attended the September 2019 Sweeney board meeting to assess the organizational needs prior to providing a response. I had an opportunity to view the board dynamics and provide professional feedback regarding opportunities for growth to inform the next steps. I determined at the time that the work needed within the organization was going to require sustained long-term facilitation as the baseline equity knowledge of the group was inconsistent. I was not in a position given the current demands on my time to provide the depth of engagement needed and I wanted to share items at a glance that could be addressed for immediate impact. I wrote to Sylvia Bogert, Executive Director, with the suggestions noted. One, the, the President Leslie Hammond did not preside over the board meeting with transparency or with equity in alignment with board procedures and process. Two, it appeared the board members raised concerns regarding organizational risks and bylaw adherence, which appeared to be conflated and reduced to personality conflicts and personal grievances. grievances. The room lacked transparency at the best. And three, this was the most evident to me, is that equity issues were continually being tabled and brushed off as irrelevant. Every time someone brought them up, they said, we'll talk about it next time. 
Based on my observations, I made recommendations to have a neutral party run the board meetings to adhere to the agenda, create a system of checks and balances for minority positions and voices to be heard so that motions uh, made were congruent with proposals. I emphasized the need to prioritize diversity and equity in their organizational agenda as it did not seem to be a consideration at that time. Initially, I offered to donate two, two hours of training to the board and I later increased my my offer to $6,000 worth of training, um, which would happen over time because I value the efforts made by some of the board members to affect positive change. I value this city and I felt like it would be a good opportunity to help everybody get on the same page in terms of the basics. However, I never received a response from Sweeney to proceed with the work and I ultimately understand that this Sweeney board voted down equity training altogether. They didn't have to use me, that would have been fine if they would have chosen someone else. It just kind of needed to be done and they, the board seemed to think that it wasn't a priority. What I witnessed was the board could not be bound to, con to considering equity if they did not have a shared understanding. Everybody kind of needs to be on the same page, speak the same language about the same thing at the same time. And to understand it requires concerted effort with ongoing training and facilitation. They voted down all training, even free training, and that will make it nearly impossible for them to get on the same page. I applaud the City of Portland COVID resolution centered around equity as a priority, and my concern is the community is not being served by this organization in alignment with these goals. To further know this organization is being taxpayer funded without metrics that bind them to a commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion is definitely cause for alarm. Uh, thank you for your time and have a good day. As a member of the board, I would be open to having the Sweeney board be the test drive and that uh, for an equity and inclusion lens polishing exercise. Uh, we could get uh, professors or dignitaries that would come for free. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who would be honored to get in front of us for free. Yep. And, uh, and give us a little polishing of the equity inclusion lens. Again, test drive it, phase one with the Sweeney board. Hello, my name is Carol Porto, and I have worked with nonprofits and on campaigns since I was in junior high school. I've been with Sweeney since 2014, and I've been the secretary of the executive board. I've been uh, the public safety chairperson and uh, South Burlingame treasurer and secretary, and I don't know what else. Um, when so much civic good is needed today, I feel very sorry to have to tell you this story. I share with you the current culture that Sweeney has created to protect the agenda of the majority in the room. I've witnessed and been made aware of numerous acts of bullying, defensiveness, scapegoating, belittling, and character assassinations from Sweeney board officers and board members towards those with minority positions. I've come to learn that these are characteristics of the white supremacist culture. People who advance equity and proper practices are the recipients of the greatest amount of bullying. In pre-COVID-19 days, these behaviors were blatantly on display in the boardroom, committee meetings, and in email. Today, it's unfortunately present in Zoom meetings and communications. In Sweeney today, asking questions and giving points of clarification are considered dissent and they face the mute button. Examples of this behavior, but not a not the full list, unfortunately. Uh, equity and Inclusion Chairperson, Laura Campos, a minority indigenous woman and Sweeney volunteer for decades, recently resigned her position on June 24th this year, stating Leslie Hammond had interfered with her duties, issued threats such as, quote, if you do this, you've made an enemy of me, unquote, and denigrated her publicly over the course of her service. Shannon Hiller Webb, has been an ongoing target for bullying and suppression by President Leslie Hammond, members of the Executive Committee and several board members and other committee members. Shannon publicly expresses concerns about the risk to the organization posed by leadership behavior in emails and meetings. Tactics used by leadership against her include defaming her character, calling her a liar, physically bullying her, encouraging her to resign due to lack of duty of care, threatening her with lawsuits, grievances, cease and desist orders, and forced board removal. 
The Sweeney Board and some members tried to force Sharon and Marie Tyvel to file personal grievances that they did not hold. Such practices are not in compliance with Sweeney bylaws, policies, or civic standards of practices, uh, or against their whistleblower policy either. Katie Daly, a board member, attended and noted that an emergency executive committee meeting did not adhere to the agenda and that the meeting minutes did not reflect the discussion that had taken place of pursuing a grievance or arbitration against Shannon. A staff member witnessed Leslie verbally assaulting Marie Tyvel after a board meeting. An unpublished executive committee meeting on June 19th in which the board business was discussed was held. This is a violation of standards and practices. In attendance were Janet Hawkins, Leslie Hammond, Steve Mullinex, and Maria Ramirez, and Sylvia Bogart. This discussion included statements that, quote, Shannon and Marie were mentally unstable and that the president had sought an attorney to represent Sweeney in a cease and desist to be executed on Shannon and Marie, unquote. Leslie muted Rob Lennox, then the president of South Burlingame Neighborhood Association, seven times during the May board meeting this year while he was expressing a minority opinion and asking for clarification. Rob Lennox was told to calm down by President Leslie Hammond in a group email when he voiced an infraction and violation of the standards and practices. While serving as Sweeney secretary, President Leslie Hammond attempted to pressure me, I was the secretary, while I was serving on the board to alter minute meetings with inaccurate information and to include information that was not stated during the meeting. I hear this practice continues. This was in direct violation to the standards and practice with our civic life contract and all um, definitions of meeting minutes. Jill Gaddis, former watershed chair, resigned after her issues of being bullied and publicly disrespected by then Vice President John Gibbon were raised to but never addressed by President Leslie Hammond. These are but a few of the bad practices that have occurred at Sweeney in the last years. Those who advance the cause of equity are the recipients of the current Sweeney leaderships and greatest amount of bullying. What behavior would other members of the community receive, and why is the city funding such behavior? Thank you for your time. Thing. Janet, was there an executive committee meeting between when I attended at uh, June 17th and her resignation on June 23rd? There was not, I don't believe. There wasn't. Look at the records. There wasn't. There was no meeting. Okay. Okay. We're looking at. Bob, I think she's answered your questions. I want to no, go. No, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm going to con. I want. All right, we have Jackie and Don. Jackie, I'm on a Zoom want... call. That, Don, do you so want? So I would like to quantify this. I didn't hear her. So we will finish please... quantifying later, Rob, when we get to. No, this. no, this. I'm sorry, you're out of order. I'm going to let Don speak, and then I'm going to let Jackie speak. Under Robert's rules. Please question. Lee. My name is Janet Coleman, and I live in the Swirl neighborhood. I appreciate the good work being done by the city to address equity as a priority. Commissioner Amanda Fritz stated, as we act to uplift marginalized community members, we affirm that we are all part of the same social and civic fabric, and that we are stronger as a city when all our communities are whole. Civic Life has outlined that their program and partner organizations be funded with grants that help residents get involved and that facilitate equalizing the voice and influence of Portland's communities. This program is meant to overcome barriers to participation and expand accessibility to our city while empowering responsiveness to various opportunities for involvement. The standards of practice that accompany these grants outline best practices to support these goals. They exist to protect the vulnerable and disenfranchised because it's not the bullies that need them. 
These protections set to hold leaders accountable include representation in community forums, advance notice of meetings, the right to speak, accurate and timely records of members, votes, and decisions, and a recourse for corrective action. The displayed quote from Leslie Hammond rings alarms on many levels. Equity, a red herring? I would hope an organization funded by our taxpayer dollars would have oversight to ensure that they are in alignment with the mission of Civic Life's funding goals and the city's equity priorities. This is part of a pattern from Sweeney President Leslie Hammond that is dismissive of others. She stated in an email, my sense is the Code Change Committee was a group of youngsters who want to remake the world and were never told or encouraged to understand the value of neighborhoods. Portland's neighborhood coalitions were established in order to make it easier for all citizens to engage in local government. Sweeney is not facilitating this engagement, nor is it a safe place for dissenting voices. Sweeney's board has had little to no change in its personnel for many years. The current system does not succeed at representing the many. It has come to represent the few. Thank you for your time. My name is Catherine Daly, and I am the Sweeney Board Representative from the Arnold Creek Neighborhood Association. I thank you for your public service and for your attention. I have professional experience advising companies on how to develop effective boards and committees. My concerns are with governance and oversight failures of the Sweeney Board of Directors. No single committee or individual should control Sweeney, but in the following examples, it appears that is the case. On September 27th, I attended an emergency Sweeney Executive Committee meeting, which was convened for a specific reason at the direction of the Sweeney Board. When the committee did not adhere to the posted agenda during the meeting, I raised a point of order. Instead of complying with board direction, there was deliberation among the Sweeney Board officers and executive director on whether a grievance should be filed against Shannon Hiller Webb. The draft September 27 meeting minutes did not reflect the content of the meeting. In an email, I asked both the secretary appointed by the president during the meeting and the president why my point of order and two topics discussed in session were not included in the minutes. The secretary replied that he was, sorry you feel that the draft minutes are missing parts. The president wrote me that there was no reason to provide their unofficial agenda that discussion of other things or issues is not relevant. Inaccurate minutes, ignoring a point of order, and failure to disclose decisions made by the executive committee outside of board direction are indicative of poor governance oversight. At the February 27 Sweeney board meeting, during discussion of a motion, the president voiced her opinion. When recognized, I respectfully disagreed. I believed the more conservative and current Sweeney document retention policy should guide us. The president immediately rebutted my comment, adding, well, I happen to be an attorney. The Sweeney board president's primary duties are to facilitate discussion to reach board consensus and to act as a liaison without bias between the board and executive director. The president should not utilize their position to dominate or dismiss discussion. In lieu of clear delineation in the bylaws of officer duties, the executive director must provide direction to board officers who do not fully understand their respective roles or rules of order. As outlined in the Sweeney bylaws, the board must be given proper notice, time to review materials which support deliberation of important matters, and an opportunity to communicate with their respective neighborhood associations. However, in spite of clear bylaw guidance, a motion for the Sweeney Board to approve application of a CARES Act PPP loan was provided hours before the May 9th board meeting. During motion discussion, it was acknowledged by the president that a review of the UMQA bank loan documentation would be preferable, but said documentation was unavailable at that time. Notwithstanding the absence of pertinent information or time and opportunity to read materials in order to be informed on the matter before them, the Sweeney Board was asked to vote on that motion. During the May 27th Sweeney Board meeting, several motions were voted upon. However, the draft minutes for that meeting did not identify each motion's voting members and the total tally numbers on motion votes varied between 23 to 27. It was unclear who authorized, who was authorized to vote on these motions and which delegate was voting for which Sweeney Board representative group. The revised draft minutes provided some detail 
but there must be assurance that board votes include only those authorized to vote pursuant to Article 4, Section 2 of the Sweeney Bylaws. Oversight can be exercised only if policies and bylaws are followed. A thorough evaluation of examples of failure to comply with Sweeney bylaws and policies, then a compulsory board training on governance and responsibilities of board members would provide much needed education and address the many areas of dysfunction. With acknowledgement and adherence to regulations, bylaws, policies, and contractual obligations, the mission of Sweeney is a benefit to our Southwest neighborhoods and to our city. Thank you for your attention. The state chapter on public records and, and nonprofit records was rewritten in 2019 and became effective in 2020. So it takes precedence over anything that ONI has written on this. It's the latest law from the state, and ONI's laws are out of compliance there. Second, I did review this policy online when I saw that letter. And I respectfully disagree with you that this would supersede state law because it's more restrictive. Well, I happen to be a lawyer, so that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. Okay. From City Council members, my name is Danielle Barker. My pronouns are she, her, they. Today we are here to talk about authentic community engagement and how we can truly begin the conversation for change. Authentic community engagement calls for institutions like SWNI to be transparent and accountable. It requires they dedicate time, energy, and resources to build mutually beneficial relationships with community members. Most importantly, it demands that they allow the community to sustainably influence public decision making. Community engagement processes must allow people of color, indigenous, immigrant and low-income communities to secure benefits from public plans and investments. Resilience and healing from past traumas within historically marginalized communities are vital outcomes of authentic community engagement. Effective engagement requires the implicitly white supremacist systems that have perpetrated the harm to first transform before they can effectively engage with communities they have historically failed. Coalitions like SWNI must be intentional in developing lasting collaborative relationships with people of color, indigenous, immigrant, and low-income communities which are systemically under-resourced. Decisions and investments that affect housing, transportation, land use, economic development are expressly in the purview of neighborhood coalitions. And SW has been called out specifically in the historical context of racist planning for creating the income inequality divide. How can you build trust and repair the injustices of the past with marginalized communities when SWNI does not adhere to the standards and practices in place to protect them? The actions of the officers of SWNI board show consistent, ongoing, habitual disregard of required meeting notice, open meetings and public record access, accurate meeting minutes, agenda adherence, and most important, meeting facilitation without bullying and without bias. I agree with the, with the Portland City Auditor, finding that accountability is limited, rules and funding models are outdated, and that it requires the attention of the full council to act. Why has there been no significant change since their report in 2016? Is SWNI aligned with the city's goals? Should they be funded by taxpayer money? 
This is a defining moment in time for City Council to show their support for equity that is aligned with the City's resolution statement, COVID Equity Toolkit, Bureau Director's Statement for Prioritizing Equity in Their Work and the Directive of Civic Life. To truly exercise your power to bring change, ensuring organizations that do not align with outlined equity initiatives in statements that are no longer funding. This is a defining moment in time for City Council to show their support for equity that is aligned with the City's resolution statement, COVID Equity Toolkit, Bureau's Director's Statement on Prioritizing Equity in Their Work and the Directive of Civic Life. To truly exercise your power to bring change, ensuring organizations that do not align with outlined equity initiatives and statements are no longer funded. I fear no action in light of what has been presented will continue to create an environment of distrust in our government. Our cities need to truly be working for all voices all people and all residents of this community to engage with their government. I implore you to take this moment and make it worth something. Please do not turn a blind eye. Please be for change. Thank you for your time, Danielle Barker. If you look at that, it doesn't say um, you were you had to fire people. All it says is you were impacted, and Sweeney was definitely impacted. Sweeney will continue to be impacted, as well as many many other companies. And I would say on a scale of one to ten, where Turn one there. is probably a restaurant, That's and ten is the Los Angeles Lakers who were entitled to COVID or to the PPP money. Really? Okay. Yes. That, that's time. Okay. okay. I'm going to call on Marie Tyler. Well, Sweeney's about an eight. <laughs> Marie. Hello. My name is Robert Lennox. My pronouns are he and him. I am the vice president of South Berlin Game Neighborhood Association, SBNA. I was the president for the 2018, 2019, and the 2019, 20 terms. I was also the alternate representative to the Sweeney Board. I hope to shed some light on my experiences to inform your grant funding decision before you. In October of 2019, the City Treasurer, who was also the Sweeney's president, personal accountant, resigned. As Treasurer, he oversaw the Sweeney books and reported to the Board. The interim Treasurer appointed after his resignation was the Sweeney Board Treasurer during the time of the 2010 embezzlement of the Sweeney funds. The board then agreed to hire the past treasurer's accounting company to prepare their IRS filings for the same period for which he was treasurer. Because of the potential conflicts of interest, our association representative to Sweeney, Ms. Hiller Red, sought financial records. Upon this news, other members of Sweeney also requested similar information. The executive committee and Sweeney board denied her and the other members' request for documents related to the financials. The stated reason for denial was the RRS for nonprofit document retention requirements superseded the contract with Civic Life because the documents fell outside the ORS document retention requirement time period. The contract with Civic Life and Sweeney's own document management policy required a much longer retention of documents. South Burlingame requested an opinion from the city attorney on this matter asking whether the contract with the city was still in force or if the ORS superseded their agreement. The city attorney's opinion was that the ORS did not supersede the city's contract with Sweeney. To this, Civic Life requested the same records in May under their contracted rights and gave Sweeney over 30 days to comply with the request. To this day, this request for documents have not been fully satisfied. Responding to this request on June 26, Sweeney sent Civic Life an estimate for almost $32,000 to produce the requested records. 
This nearly 32,000 fee estimate applies to the Civic Life's request, who has granted Sweeney about 3.2 million taxpayer dollars over the past 10 years. Please consider, if it was applied to an individual, this would be a cost prohibitive barrier to access public records, and it lacks equity. It is beyond the pale for Sweeney to charge the city, since Sweeney is contractually bound to supply these documents. This is punitive to a partner and denies the city with critical oversight required by the grant contract. Just this last month, an email was sent to Sweeney's board from Sweeney's president and the executive director stating that their concern is regarding potential litigation of the content of the records requested. So potential litigation is the new reason for not complying. Sweeney is now asking the board to hire an attorney to protect their rights. Over the past three or four months, Sweeney has now slow rolled the responses, denied their requests under false claim. They, now, they are now trying to assert some privilege by litigation to keep records from being released. This begs the question, what exactly is there to hide? To assert the Sweeney, I assert that Sweeney as a nonprofit 501c3 with a mission of service to the community, which is funded primarily with tax dollars, to proceed with transparency, reasonable access, and accommodation to these types of requests. At a minimum, these records requests should be satisfied prior to awarding the next fiscal grant to Sweeney. Thank you for your time. So I, I listened to the things outlined by Janet, and it seems to me there's a long-standing practice of redaction, and that's a pretty common practice. So why would redacting the documents with that sensitive information and providing them to the request be problematic? Well, most yeah, of the information, uh, um, may, I, may I respond, Leslie? Yeah, go ahead, Janet. Uh, most of the information the city has talked about um, basically the instruction they've given us that everything will be become public information when turned over to them. And we would um, essentially be turning over information to the city without any guarantee that that information will be kept confidential or privileged when we know there is this potential for breaching confidentiality or relaying privileged information about individuals. And some of the content of the files was attorney-client privilege. I should add that in there. Um, so we essentially aren't trying to redact anything. We are essentially uh, holding back information that we feel uh, is with our purview and our board of directors right under Oregon nonprofit law mm. to hold this information back okay. until we have legal counsel. Okay, now she... Since we can't even get into the building, we can't do a paper uh, help right now. I mean, you could go down and do a flyer and, and Sweeney could reimburse you because we're supposed to give you 200 copies a month of printed material. It's not fair. It's not an accusation. So I'm going to start this real quick. I quit. Oh, oh, Have fun. Okay. This is this is the stupidest thing I think I've ever seen. This is. I would agree. Yeah. Okay. It's Okay. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is we've had two email blasts this week on Sukri's position on disclosure of documents. Yes, and I read everything just to. <laughs> well, the thing that, of course, is not coming out either from Sukri or from um, Shannon and Rob is that we've already produced 50% of the documents that they've asked for. We have five years worth of minutes and motions and correspondence all on the website. And that was available day one when Marie and Shannon asked for those documents, but they've never acknowledged 
that. They've never acknowledged that they've got 50% of the documents already and that they can look at them at any time they want. What they wanted was very sensitive material around the embezzlement lawsuit and some um, personnel actions that happened in 2010 to 2012. And they wanted personal emails and they wanted executive session minutes, which we don't do. We don't give executive session minutes to anybody. We just tell people what the executive session decided, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a mixture of very sensitive materials, a demand for things that under the ONI rules they aren't allowed to have. And then they wanted, I think one of the demands was to have all of his emails with everybody for 2019. So I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm sort of grappling with this. Suk is not our boss. This is our board. We can decide what we want to disclose or not disclose, right? And the board voted against disclosing more than we already had online in February and March. That, and I sent those minutes to Suk so that she'd know. So with that issue, the other issue is we have someone who won't accept the board decisions, which is basically somewhere between what, 20 and 27 people, and is doing an end run around our organization and trying to bring political pressure to bear on us. Yeah, that's, that's completely obvious. I, I was ready to write Rob a letter about what don't you understand about the word no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might, here's, here's, Okay, so I want to listen to what you have to say, but I want to ask you to think about two things. First of all, we have produced 50% of the documents and that say years six and seven, eight, nine, and 10 are all in on paper and are in the city archives or storage facility or in the Sweeney office, neither of which we can get to. Mm -hmm. So even if the board said, okay, we'll give you years six and seven, right? We can't get to those until September because we're locked out of the building and the city archives are closed. So that's just a fact, right? So this will come up again, of course, at the next meeting or we'll have a special meeting on it. But the, but the other thing is this constant, um, for me, it feels like badgering from oh, it's, Shannon. It, it's trolling. They're, they're <laughs> right. Trolling. But no. when it happens, the board doesn't usually step up and say, now, wait a minute, this is disrespectful to the chair or disrespectful to Leslie. Nobody takes that position because it often happens so quickly that people don't have time to respond to it. So I've been thinking about can, how to- I'll just interject here. I think okay. a, a lot of the board members, we tend to look at Steve and Don Bach, okay? Uh, Sam from time to time, but it's Steve and Don Bach all the way back to our summer emergency sessions where outside of yourself, you know, they, they were trying to, you know, be put, supportive, be, be supportive, try and show that you've got our ear. And Don was like, you know, what exactly is your issue? Why don't you talk about it? You know, that sort of thing. So uh, I think a lot of others take the same approach as I do. And that is, is I tend to let a couple, one or two people do that probing, do that supportive, uh, try and diffuse. I think it had just turned into a, you know, um, it'll just turn very discombobulated if every one of us tried to individually weigh in and it, with commentary. I, 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 I agree because and, then and it evolves into you know, argument. I agree, I, I agree. So I think I might have a solution. You know, Rob in his latest letter said that he thought I was talking too much and I should be managed, I think. I don't know what his word was exactly because my leadership was poor. Um, but I have a suggestion. He wants to form a committee on Robert's Rules of Order. And, and what I would like you to consider is if Steve, and he has agreed to it, if Steve could be appointed as a rules advisor, the person that reads Robert Rules of Order, if somebody calls, you know, like a point of information, he will read it out and say, this is what it is, and this is what the, what the, the, the uh, board can do with it, because that's very hard for me to do when I'm running a meeting. It's really hard for me to instantly think about 
Robert's Rules of Order and what they are and how it works. But if the, if the board would say, no, we aren't interested in a committee to talk about Robert's Rules of Order, but we would like to appoint Steve Molnix as the rules advisor for this coming year, there's a couple of benefits to it. Steve is well thought of, he's deliberate, yep. he's fair. Secondly, we don't have to get into the bylaws and create a new position like parliamentarian. He is, he's, his position is already in place and he has the time to be a rules advisor for the board because his main responsibility is to run the spring retreat Great. or if yep. I'm not there to run the meeting. What do you think about that as, as a sort of a solution to having a dispassionate third party inform the board what the rules are? I, I, I like it. And, and if Rob can't buy into Steve, then I, I think he's going to further just get piled on no votes by the rest of the board. I, I think a whole bunch of the board members would say yes to this. Uh, That's what I'm hoping, and, it, and I think it takes the issue, which we didn't get resolved uh, in this last year, uh, it gets resolved in a simple way with a person who is well thought of by the majority of the board. It won't make Rob ha happy because he'll want to devise some sort of scheme. <laughs> but I will honestly tell you that if the board votes to have a committee to decide what Roberts of Rules of Order should be used and, and how I should be managed through those rules, I'm afraid you might see me going out the door. No. I just I just don't want to do that. No, um, the, these meetings uh, were never meant to be with a full-blown parliamentarian and that. You got a, a president, you look at the job titles and duties of your of the position that you're in. In the same way with me as chair at Sweeney. Uh, yeah. It states that the expectations are that we're going to lead these meetings, set the agenda, you know, push aside uh, things that are clearly, you know, um, off base, off. All right, Shannon. Sylvia, how many times have you and your staff accessed the building since March closure? So um, I think it was uh, as of yesterday, it was so as of today, 22 times. And again, I have been in every day since last Tuesday. So that's where the bulk of it has been. And prior to that, it's usually once a week just to pick up the mail. Have you accessed the copier machine during your stays? This Tuesday, absolutely. No, throughout your throughout the time that you've accessed the building, have you been making Yes, calls? yes, okay. so I access the copier. Uh, I would go in and pick up mail. Most of it is land use notices that I would scan and send to John Tapero to then send out to the neighborhoods. My name is Marie Tyval, and I have been the Hillsdale Neighborhood Association President and Sweeney Board Representative for the past year. My pronouns are she, her. I want to acknowledge first and foremost that my white privilege has allowed me to spend literally hundreds and hundreds of hours over the past year in an attempt to hold Sweeney accountable, all to no avail. Consequently, I submitted two public records requests to Executive Director Sylvia Bogert and President Leslie Hammond in early 2020. My first records request was denied by Sweeney and my second request was ignored entirely. I then reached out to the Oregon Department of Justice, the Portland City Ombudsman, and the Multnomah District Attorney's Office for assistance. In addition, Civic Life's contract with Sweeney requires records requested by the city to be promptly provided. Civic Life made a records request to Sweeney in April 2020. On June 26, Civic Life received a quote from Sweeney for $31,885.50 to produce these records. While I let that number sink in, I also want to share that while Sweeney claims to be a nonprofit as a justification for not turning over records, they also want to charge civic life as if Sweeney were a government agency. Sweeney clearly wants to have their cake and eat it too. The most recent public records requests I made were to Sweeney and Umpqua Bank because Sweeney refused numerous times 
to provide the board with all loan documentation when they applied for a Paycheck Protection Loan and received $66,332. I subsequently filed complaints as a result of Sweeney's refusal uh, with these organizations in 2020. The Small Business Administration, no response received to date. Department of Justice, Charitable Activities, after contacting Sweeney, DOJ declined to investigate. Umqua Bank, I filed a uh, public records request and they declined to provide records. And finally, the Multnomah District Attorney, I reached out to them and appealed uh, the denial of my records request to District Attorney Adam Gibbs. On May 19th, Mr. Gibbs denied my appeal based on his determination that Sweeney was, is not, quote unquote, a public body. Sweeney Executive Director Sylvia Bogert has held her position for 40 years. She has been present at almost all meetings where the OCCL standards of practice or ONI standards of practice, Sweeney bylaws and policies were flagrantly ignored time and time again by the board. Since I rarely hear Sylvia's voice calling for transparency and accountability, I am worried that she is in dereliction of her duty. Finally, and very importantly, select board members have informed the board for literally over a year that actions taken and statements made by President Leslie Hammond and the executive officers and the board continue to put the contract with civic life at risk, again, to absolutely no avail. Thank you again for your time. My name is Diane Victoria. I'm a member of the SBNA board, but I'm here today as a citizen of the city of Portland. I want to express my concern over Sweeney's application for a PPP loan. Without any apparent oversight, this application appears to cross some ethical boundaries and is siphoning money away from its primary intention, which is to help small businesses survive during the pandemic. The PPP loan program launched April 3rd in response to COVID hardship, and the intent of the program was to protect jobs for eight weeks and incentivize employers to maintain payroll through June 30th. A claim that current economic uncertainty makes the loan request necessary to support ongoing operations was required. The SBA PPP loans are forgivable provided three requirements are met. Loans are used exclusively for intended purposes. Loans are used to offset more, no more than eight weeks of eligible payroll expenses. Businesses retain employees at salary levels comparable to before the crisis. During a May 9th emergency board meeting, Sweeney President Leslie Hammond stated, we have sufficient money in the board fund to pay the loan off should we need to. The money has been there for three to four years. Executive Director Sylvia Bogart stated, at the end of the last fiscal year, the board had $80,000. If these numbers are true, what hardship exists that necessitates a PPP loan for Sweeney? When asked, the Sweeney Executive Committee refused to release all loan application documentation for fiscal oversight around claims made to secure the loan. Current hardship claims seem unclear given that Civic Life grant funding remained in place through the end of June and adequate financial reserves to cover the period of payroll and utilities through the end of the PPP loan funding period existed. Former Treasurer, Current Auditor, and SWRHL Rep for Sweeney, Charlie Van Rossen, stated that Sweeney rated an 8 out of 10 on the scale for need for the monies. Meanwhile, all grant funding to Sweeney was expected to remain at the same level as fiscal year 2019-20, which claim covers 85% of their total revenue. The remaining 15% is a mix of donations and ad revenue, the bulk of which comes from City Bureau advertising. Sweeney, who received $66,332, opted to repurpose Civic Life funds and create a CEAP $1,000 grant award to neighborhood and business associations who claimed COVID impact. They would allot $25,000 to repurpose Civic Life monies to COVID relief and then claim hardship for the use of the PPP loan. In other words, creatively moving money. As an example of a proposed use of a CEAP grant, Hillsdale Neighborhood Association submitted a request for COVID monies to be used for planting a pandemic oak and sending a mailer announcing they now have Zoom meetings. Meanwhile, businesses in our community are permanently closing. Ohmbase, 
a longtime yoga studio in Hillsdale, applied for multiple loans, did not secure any, and subsequently announced its closure. My neighborhood association took a position to disavow the act of taking PPP monies and passed a motion asking the monies to be returned. At the time of the application, we know there were limited funds in the PPP program and minority businesses were disproportionately not being granted loans. SBNA board members raised concerns about the equity of taking the loan and inquired if Civic Life was in support of this action. We were told by Sweeney that Civic Life supported attaining this loan. As an example for, of why my concerns over the ethics of applying for this loan, Sweeney board member Murray Terrell stated it was not the board's role to be guided by ethics in regards to the PPP loan, saying, if we don't apply, we could be leaving money on the table. The end of the PPP funding period coincided with the end of the Civic Life Fiscal Year 2019-2020 grant agreement, which provided funding for payroll, utilities, etc. Hence, the hardship claims are unfounded. Arnold Creek Neighborhood Association Delegate Catherine Daly reached out to the other six coalitions to learn how they perceived the PPP loan and found that only one had sought and received it but decided to return the money should their funding be stable through this fall Civic Life contract review. She used this information to present to the Sweeney Board a motion proposing the same option. This motion failed to pass. The Sweeney Fiscal Management Policy clearly states the Board of Directors is responsible for compliance. To my knowledge, Sweeney still has not released supplemental documentation supporting the loan claims after multiple requests. An organization that is supposed to speak for all neighborhood residents seems to be speaking and acting on the behalf of a select few. It is difficult for me to see and hear small local businesses that are vital to the local economy possibly closing their doors permanently while Sweeney was able to get a loan that could have saved one of these businesses. Neighborhoods like Multnomah Village and Hillsdale are desirable because of the locally owned businesses. If given a choice between a pandemic oak or saving a local business, I wonder if the residents of Hillsdale would really pick the oak. Civic Life is considering funding Sweeney almost $300,000. I asked the City Council to exercise some oversight in regard to Sweeney's funding and any PPP monies received. Thank you for your time. Uh, Teddy, are you uh, saying that the Civic Life funding is related to, uh, with being withheld is related to a COVID hardship? in regards to use of the PPP loan? The question is? Are you stating that the Civic Life, uh, defunding the, the monies that are being withheld from Civic Life are uh, related to COVID hardship for use of that PPP loan? I'm not stating any of that. I'm just stating that we're using the PPP loan well, you actually stated that because of the Civic Life funding, uh, the, that you'll be using the PPP loan. So, are you stating that Civic Life funding or holding is having anything to do with COVID? Um, if you look at that budget, we're anticipating a $75,000 shortfall next year. And you're telling me we should get back $66,000 that no one else is going to use except for Donald Trump. And basically, you're giving Donald back a lot of money. Um, it makes no difference because there's still money available that people can get. So we're not taking it away from anybody else. Um, I would like to say to uh, Marie Tyvel's point about the money possibly could be used in other directions that she thinks there's more of a, um, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to say in a better way. But I, I do believe, I mean, I also read the New York Times, but I have 
a question for you is what's to show us, guarantee us, promise us that if we turn back money, any money, dollar twenty-five, that it's going to go in the direction that you think that it should go to. My name is Adam Lamott and I live in the Swirl neighborhood. After a review of the Sweeney 2021 budget recently passed by the board, I have questions which may go unanswered because I understand accessing records has been problematic. The increase in the budget in a down economy was surprising. Monthly costs will clearly be less, not more, in the current climate. Sweeney puts out a monthly newspaper, Southwest News. July has always been their biggest mailing, as it is mailed to all households, not just subscribers, and typically has four extra pages, 20 in total, to promote summer events. July 2020 was only 16 pages, perhaps because, understandably, there are no events this summer. Wouldn't this be a printing savings? Sweeney recently put out a COVID mailer with the cost of around $5,000, which has been claimed as part of their COVID hardship. I understand the cost of printing. This was largely covered by the BPS cleanup grant funds of approximately $3,000. We learned last fall BPS would no longer be fiscally sponsoring cleanups, and BPS allowed the monies already paid to Sweeney to be dedicated to the COVID newspaper. Wouldn't this offset the unanticipated cost of the COVID flyer? Sweeney holds multiple monthly meetings. Savings on rent would have begun in April and will continue through the fall. At the March 18th Finance Committee meeting, Ms. Bogert said, Sweeney's prepaid room rentals for this time period will be credited to rental costs in the next fiscal year. Clearly, budget items like rent and event costs are going down, not up. Regarding donations, Ms. Bogert stated that donations as of December 31st totaled $8,022. This puts Sweeney very near its annual goal of 9,000 plus 2,500 in staff bonus funds. Further, from the February 19th Finance Committee meeting, she notes that donations were up in January. There was also a dedicated donation of 2,500 to pay the approved fall bonus to employees. So why did the treasurer and secretary state that donations are significantly down for 2020 and make claims of these hardships for the PPP loans? Former Sweeney Treasurer Charlie Van Rossen resigned suddenly in October and was subsequently hired to the tune of $2,000 in January to audit those same books. This raises potential conflict of interest, especially since I understand Mr. Van Rossen is also employed by the Sweeney president as her personal accountant. New costs in these, this year's budget appear as extraneous. It is confusing how Sweeney has claimed COVID-related hardship to justify a PPP loan. I'd be curious to see documentation provided to the bank to support receiving the loan, as I'm having a hard time finding little to no COVID impact, let alone the current economic hardship. When I review the financials provided to the board, I find them to be inconsistent and incomplete and would request other reports be generated for proper fiscal oversight from the board of directors. Thank you for your time. Laura, yeah. I, you know, when I read the bylaws, it says that individuals and groups are encouraged. So one of the things that I'm concerned about as the equity chairs, as we continue to welcome people of color or, you know, other disadvantaged groups who are being marginalized to participate, um, I caution against the face-to-face -face because there's an unequal power between the parties and it um, I, I have issues of safety at this point. That's why there's an option for me. Yeah, that's that's an option no, it has, well, and it yeah. is provided by, by the bylaws. So it may be that the bylaws need to be amended to address those safety issues. Well, no, it just but says it encouraged. So I don't, I'm not going to be forced into a face to face yeah, right. where I personally feel unsafe. Right. Um, I have a lot of respect for what they've been doing and, and for them to come to the table and be really active after um, so many years of not being at the table, right? Um, uh, it's not like we haven't had 
um, English as second language um, speakers in our neighborhoods or immigrants or refugees or um, members of the Muslim community, like they've been living here. They just haven't had, um, they haven't felt safe and comfortable coming to these meetings in the past. My name is Amelia Fowler and I live in Hillsdale. My pronouns are she, her. I am a social worker and community care is at the center of my personal and professional life. I have lived in Southwest for four years and two years ago I attended a Hillsdale Neighborhood Association meeting in an attempt to learn more about the issues impacting my community. The room consisted of mostly white people aggressively opposing a transportation project that would likely bring more diversity to the neighborhood. I witnessed a hostile environment with participants yelling and posturing themselves aggressively to suppress voices when opposing views were expressed. I did not feel safe. We know that Southwest Portland has been actively keeping minorities out of neighborhoods for decades through many tactics, including preventing access to affordable housing and transportation. My experience at the Hillsdale Neighborhood Association meeting was indicative of those actions. When I learned recently that neighborhood associations could apply for a Community Engagement Action Program grant allotment of $1,000 to assist with COVID-related hardships, I was further discouraged. The Hillsdale Neighborhood Association Board voted to use the monies for a mailer in planting a pandemic oak tree. These actions are insensitive to the true hardship being experienced and continue to prove the lack of concern for equity in the community. We must center our actions, voices, and support around equity. The current structure and culture of both Hillsdale Neighborhood Association and Southwest Neighborhoods Inc. do not support equity. If I, as a white woman, did not feel safe in this environment, would a minority in attendance feel safe and comfortable raising their voice? The city of Portland and Civic Life have committed to centering equity and had, have emphasized this during the time of COVID. Writing statements of support and using an equity lens are not enough. There must be action. An action that can be taken is redirecting Southwest Neighborhood Inc's funding to an organization in Southwest that is already doing the work and elevating our most vulnerable voices. This is your opportunity to take action in a meaningful way. We thank you for your time. A functioning Sweeney of yesterday may not be the Sweeney of today. Organizations over the course of 40 years ebb and flow and can stagnate. Organizations make mistakes. However, when the same actions are repeated, called into question and continue, it is a pattern of behavior that is culturally entrenched within the organization. We are here because we want to be part of the change needed and hope to bring solutions for consideration to the problems identified. We appreciate you pausing the Sweeney funding for a forensic audit. We know that oversight is sorely needed and hope the audit can provide a roadmap for a response. Items we as a group have discussed that could have greater impact of ta taxpayer funds towards the mission could include small to large changes specific to Sweeney's performance and beyond Sweeney. In regards to Sweeney's performance, we feel there should be Board term limits to all members of the board, regardless of position held, to be enacted immediately. That no neighborhood association have greater percentage of representation as voting members of the board. Removing voting rights of the committee chairs and board officers to ensure neighborhood associations are equitably represented in voting. Sweeney bylaws were written with an assumption that individuals are to be the focus of the grievance process. However, Sweeney needs a process included in their bylaws for bringing concerns for organizational risks and lack of compliance to governing documents when the officers of the board cause the harm. Looking more broadly at the civic life oversight of the coalitions, it could require all coalitions bid for funding consistent as a standard practice for all other organizations receiving taxpayer dollars from city council. Civic Life should attend quarterly coalition board meetings to ensure compliance with grant agreements, standards of practice, and support the 2016 directive by the city auditor for greater oversight. Civic Life should capture baseline metrics for, from coalitions and provide performance metrics, milestones, and quarterly goals that align with the mission, including equity, and be actively involved in providing feedback and implementation of action plans with reporting requirements, oversight, and accountability tied to funding. They should create accountability triggers to ensure compliance with contractual obligations, i.e. compliance with 
standards and practices, audits, records, and access that have established penalty processes in place, and there should be improved record keeping to preserve historical and institutional knowledge lost with Bureau staff changes. Finally, we have some new big ideas to share. The city has a precedent of not funding two coalitions in the 1990s so that they could assume staffing the two locations with city personnel. The city could entertain staffing a Southwest coalition. The ordinance fundamentally identifies 501c3 nonprofit status organizations to partner with by funding a mission alignment with their directive for civic engagement. If there are no other, is there no other established 501c3 who could assume the responsibility currently in Southwest that is already centering equity? Can an existing coalition absorb the 17 neighborhood associations of Sweeney? Finally, could neighborhood associations be funded directly by Civic Life to remove coalitions from the middle? These are just some of the ideas that we have. I'm certain there are more, and we thank you for your time and consideration.
you know, and I, I'm going back to the bylaws things because there are other articles in the bylaws that talk about whistleblowers. There's other remedies and protections that are part of the bylaws. So I too am a little concerned that by focusing on two elements, we're we're trying to weigh in on how how the agreement can proceed. I guess what I would come in is with Michael's um, amendment. It opens up the entire bylaws. Sure. So there are um, lots of things. Mean, people can file favorite. lawsuits. They can file a lawsuit for defamation. There's a lot of things that can be done if you tie it into the bylaws. Can so, the board file a lawsuit? Yes. Yeah, they can. Because so, of the, the some of the materials that have been sent to the board. They're, the executive committee or the board doesn't have any. They have their own rights to file their own grievances if they choose. City Council members, my name is Rabbi Deborah Kolodny and I live in Multnomah Village, home to Sweeney. I'm the Executive Director of Portland United Against Hate and I'm a veteran of several social justice movements, bringing a spiritual perspective and an activist passion to racial and economic justice. My pronouns are they, them. The testimony you have heard from others more intimately involved with Sweeney provides the most vivid illustration you could find of how the district neighborhood coalition structure is broken. In this case, and in many others, it does not serve the many, but the few. As you know from your own auditor's report, this structure has existed without oversight and accountability for decades. This has allowed inequity, injustice, and even hate and trauma to grow and fester in some coalitions. The tragic story that you've heard about Sweeney of those with decades long tenure using city money to serve their agendas and disenfranchise black, brown, and immigrant populations must be addressed immediately. It's not surprising that those entrained to expect the unconditional provision of money through no bid contracts with annual increases act with bold disregard to their contractual obligations and governing bylaws. Their dismissive antagonistic behavior is steeped in the knowledge that there has been no penalty for traumatizing people with hate. This must end today. It's impossible to rebuild a broken system mired in fiscal and legal malfeasance. We must instead bring a vision of trust and hope to, the, to all those currently disenfranchised and disregarded. We must atone for, heal, and issue reparations for the past, and we must do better for our next generation. We cannot cut off entire peoples and generations from civic engagement. We must bring them into the fold. Geographically based civic organizations whose prime directive is to support homeowners through land use advocacy cannot help but be inequitable and unjust. So let us forge ahead together, meeting and serving people where the spirit moves them in organizations that identify with them culturally, ethnically, racially, and generationally. In organizations that consciously and effectively celebrate and invest in them. Sweeney has proven that it is not equipped to do so. I suggest the city take 30 days to investigate options and find one or two mission aligned 501c3s prepared to meet the needs of the residents of Southwest Portland. Residents deserve to be served by organizations that live the values that we all share. Now is the time to call upon our highest selves to fundamentally shift a decades long imbalance of power and access and to end the hate and trauma. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Melissa Kenny, Ainsworth Elementary School parent and PTA member involved with our PTA and school communities effort to improve a dangerous crosswalk at a Southwest Portland school. Ainsworth's annex crosswalk where over a hundred children, teachers and parents cross daily contains blind corners where trees are blocking views a steep downhill grade with no infrastructure to slow drivers, and substandard signage that fails to alert drivers that they're rapidly approaching a busy school crosswalk. 
A 2018 PTA study found one near miss a week between vehicles and pedestrians that approximately six cars per day do not stop for pedestrians and that the odds a vehicle may hit or nearly hit a child or an adult are one in 47. From 2018 to late 2019, we at Ainsworth PTA provided an active advocacy effort, a traffic study, and tried to work with Sweeney to locate funding and to find solutions. None of our efforts were supported by the Southwest Neighborhood Incorporated, otherwise known as Sweeney. The board members and the executive director, Sylvia Bogart, failed to respond to our emails. They failed to respond to our study and requests for help. They didn't provide support to locate past studies. They didn't facilitate any connections for our effort. As a consequence, traffic safety funding deadlines were missed. Sweeney failed to help us identify other funding opportunities that could provide safety improvements. Our PTA needed help accessing PBOT staff in the commissioner's office to remedy the dangerous sidewalk. Sweeney provided no engagement, no connections for us, leaving our PTA to leave unreturned cold call messages with Peabot and Mr. Dan Saltzman's office. Ultimately, our principal found a parent volunteer who facilitated a meeting to share our study's data and request assistance and remedies with Peabot. In fact, only one neighborhood association known as Swirl, a volunteer, Lisa Caballero, who is also a PCP, she provided active advocacy and resolution engagement, yet it appeared to us she got very little support from Sweeney board members as well. The one to 47 odds of being hit while crossing a public school crosswalk is not an acceptable safety risk. Even Peabot identified $65,000 that were needed to improve this crosswalk from the results of an unseen past study. Yet Sweeney used none of their resources to provide our community support or even funding for short-term fixes. We found this organization to be unhelpful. I personally question the amount of money they received for the very little benefit they provided our organization. And and then, why are you asking uh, that question? You know where the um, 2010 and 2012 boxes of records that have been requested by Civic Life are located? Excuse me, excuse me, Shannon. You are asking several questions. You're entitled. I have to ask a minute. One. You have. You're entitled to ask one question. And Jackie has a question about the question you're asking. I just asked. Can Sylvia ask my answer my question? She doesn't have to. That's not her responsibility. And we will talk about answer the question, question, please. Sylvia, will you please answer my question? Yeah, uh, why are you asking it? First, tell us why you're asking that. I don't have to tell you why I'm asking. I'm asking where the 2010 and 2012 boxes of records are located. Well, Again. I think he doesn't have to tell you that. Okay, so so here's the, here's the so Sh sorry, I, I haven't been recognized, but Shannon, um, it just sounds like you, you're sort of lit litigating an issue no, I'm not litigating. I'm asking because she's stated to Civic Life and to the board that she hasn't had access to the records that we've been defunded over. And so I'm trying to find out if she's accessed the building where those records are located that the Civic Life is demanding that we are currently defunded over. Actually, Shannon, you helped with the defunding, so don't sound so innocent. And secondly, she said she'd been going in since last Tuesday on a regular basis to get at those records, and she doesn't need to answer any more questions than that. Well, I can't. Uh, I think, excuse me, I think, I think questions are uh, okay, along so that. That's out of order, I believe. We're, we're I'm looking not out for. Order. I was called. We're okay, we're looking for. A, Shannon, no. you've already been noticed you that you've been disruptive. If I have to say it again, you're going to be left, you're going to have to leave the meeting. So listen. All right. 